we talk about the devil, by the way. Talking about, you know, he always likes to do stuff. Uh, uh, you know, it's amazing. Uh, you would think that sooner or later you would get immune to his tricks and stuff, you know, and his schemes. As a matter of fact, the book of Ephesians, and I know you guys are aware of the book of Ephesians, and in chapter 5, it's that great chapter uh, that talks about uh, put, you know, husbands and wives and about the greatness of the church and how it's compared to uh, relationships and so forth. And then he tells us in Ephesians 6 that we are to put on the whole armor of God that we may be able to stand in the evil day. How many of you have ever felt like you had an evil day? He said, man, I tell you, I know what an evil day is because it's like that day that he just saves up everything he has and just all pours it all out at one time, you know, and everything just begins to break loose and go crazy. And yeah, anyway, but it takes the armor of God to stand against those things that we may be able to stand against. And, and, and here's the word, the wiles, W-I-L-E-S, the wiles, old King James English word, the wiles of the devil. That word wiles comes from the Greek word methodia, from which we get our English word method or methods. So what the Bible saying about Satan is that he has methods. In other words, he's not haphazard. He's not just uh, uh, doing just, uh, just uh, spontaneous stuff everywhere, you know, and trying to do what he can at any time, but he actually has a plan. He has a method of which he's going to attack. And I know lots of times we, you know, we sense that method. And you would think that we would, we would get better at it, but hey, praise the Lord. We know what to do. Come on. <laughs> Come on, Jesus, you know, our, our strength. Um, uh, if you know Jesus as your Savior, and no one has done this yet, let me just say to you, welcome to the family of God. Uh, I, I don't know if you've ever been welcomed to the family of God. Many of you have been saved a long time, many years. But the reason I say welcome to the family of God is because I, I would like for you to understand that you are now in a different world. Uh, the world before you come to Christ is much different than the world after you come to Christ. The way you operate and function in the world of Christ is totally different from this whole crazy world that we live in out here because to prosper in, 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 in Christian world, in the Christian land, in Christian life, it requires a different currency. It's called, the currency is called faith. So the Christian life operates from a different currency than the world. And, and here it is in Hebrews 11, just written out really clearly. But without faith, it is highly unlikely. No, it, it is uh, nearly impossible. Uh, no, it is uh, almost undoable. No, what it, without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So in order to prosper in this Christ-like that, that we live, we have to live by faith. Because no matter what we do, according to Hebrews chapter 11, if it's not done by faith, it doesn't please God. It's impossible to live a life that pleases God without faith. And here's the only problem with living a faith life. Once you start living a faith life, it puts you in direct opposition to the world that you are a citizen of for this temporary time. Once you start living by faith, it puts you at, 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 at odds with this world that we live in, and, and you begin to consistently walk contrary to this world that, that surrounds you. Now, in the Old Testament, there's a wonderful story, a great story, about three Hebrew young men who found themselves pretty much in the same kind of situation that we find ourselves in, walking contrary 
to a, to a world that they lived in. And the great thing about the wonderful story and a marvelous example of what it takes to grow, what it takes to live as a Christian in a world that's contrary to you, um, these three boys had dynamic growth in their life. But it didn't happen at, uh, uh, at a kneeling bench at an altar in a service one day like we all want it to. We want to be great Christians. We want to believe God. We want to have tremendous faith and, and, and pray and grow in God and, and not be fearful of anything and have faith to believe God for everything. And we want it to happen, boom, just like that. May I say to you that it never happens just like that. It always happens. God will always lead you there. But it's not going to happen at a 30-second encounter at an altar or by praying some kind of magic prayer that opens up some, some, some kind of treasure box that is full of everything you need to, to live the, the, the faith life. Uh, it comes by experience. It comes by process. It comes as the Lord begins to take you through things and lead you through things. As a matter of fact, this story out of, out of the book of Daniel is, is just good for us to see exactly what it takes to grow and what God does. I'm just going to start reading. I'll read about 25 verses or so. Hope you don't get tired. All right? Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits and its width 6 cubits, and he set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. And King Nebuchadnezzar sent word to gather together the satraps, uh, the administrators. Satraps are like the little servant guys. The satraps, the administrators, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the, the judges, the magistrates, and all the officials of the province to come to the dedication of the image which King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So the satraps and the administrators and the governors and the counselors and the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all of the officials of the provinces gathered together for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then a herald cried aloud, To you it is commanded, O people, nations, and languages, that at the time you hear the sound of the, the horn, the flute, the harp, the lyre, and psaltery and symphony with all kinds of music, you fall down and worship the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Pretty simple instructions, right? When the, I used to call them the Babylonian Bee Gees, but I, you know, I don't know. Could be the Babylonian Beastie Boys. Who, who's current with a bee? Anyway, Beastie Boys, uh, Bee Gees. Uh, I'm old. Um, <laughs> When you hear, we Google it, when you, when you hear the music play, all right, here's the instructions. You got it really easy. Nebuchadnezzar has set an image up of himself. He wants to be worshiped. He's brought all of these people together, all of his head honchos together. And they brought all the other people that were in the surrounding area together and said, all right, now listen, it's really simple. When you hear this uh, symphony orchestra start playing over here, it, what you do is you just bow down and you worship this image of gold that is set up out here. Pretty easy, right? Got it? All right, got it. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. That's good motivation. So at that time, when all the people heard the sound of the horn, the flute, the harp, and lyre, and symphony with all kinds of music, all the people, nations, and languages fell down and worshiped the golden image which King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Therefore, at, a, at, a, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and accused the Jews. You can always count on that. There's going to always be somebody watching, That's right. That's right. right? There's going to be somebody that is, uh, well, let's just say, they're not watching for your good. And they have their eyes on you. You, you. you said you're a Christian, right? They throw it up in your face, too. Well, hey, I thought you said you were a Christian. You know, they're watching you, the Chaldeans. And the Chaldeans, watched, and they came forward, and they accused the Jews. Uh, they spoke and said to the king, Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. That was a common greeting. You, O king, have made a decree. See, now, now they're telling the king the decree he made that's going to affect these three Jewish boys that he loves and has respect for. And now, and they're basically saying, you said it, you said it, now you got to do it. You know, you, that's what you said. 
O king, you've made a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, the flute, the harp, the lyre, the psaltery, and symphony with all kinds of music shall fall down and worship the gold image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. There are certain Jews who, uh, who have not, who have, have you set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not paid due regard to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the gold image which you have set up, and we're jealous about it. Then Nebuchadnezzar, look at this, in his rage and fury, uh, this is almost immediate at hearing, that, how dare Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego not bow down? What's wrong with these boys? They know, they, did they not get the message? I mean, what, wasn't it plain and simple and easy to understand? And now he's, he's fully enraged and furious at the situation. He gave the command to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying to them, Is it true? And so you can almost hear it in his heart, right? Mm -hmm. Boys, tell me it's not true. It, it, it's not real. These Chaldeans made this up, right? It's not true that you... It, it, is it true that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image which I have set up? Now, if you're ready, he's going to give them another chance. Now, if you're ready at the time you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the harp, the lyre, the soft and symphony, and all kinds of music, and you fall down and worship the image which I have made, good. But if you do not worship, you shall be cast immediately in the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you from my hands? Nebuchadnezzar is saying, no God can deliver you from that. That's a burning, fiery furnace. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. <laughs> Fully confident. If that is the case... If you throw us in there, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar was full of fury. He lost the rage, but he still has the fury. He's full of fury. And the, and the expression on his face changed towards Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He spoke and commanded that they heat the furnace seven times more than it was usually heated. And he commanded certain mighty men of valor who were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and cast them in the burning, fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their coats their trousers, their turbans, and their go other garments, and they were cast into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Just so you know, it was really hot. It wasn't some fake furnace. Therefore, because the king's command was urgent and the furnace exceedingly hot, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The furnace was so hot that the guys that threw them in the furnace died. That's hot. That outside the furnace, that's hot. I mean, this is not going to be some, some, some little uh, non-observed rescue mission here. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down, bound into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. The first, I'm going to give you a blank to fill in. The first thing you need to put on your, on your sheet is persecution. How do you grow as a child of God? What, what? What, what happens that, that, that initiates growth in the kingdom of God? What, what pushes you forward? Well, according to Shadrach and Meshach and, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, uh, some good old-fashioned persecution will do it. You know, we have to get serious about what's going on in our Christian life in order to push ourselves to grow. Uh, we're, we're, we're a group of twice-born men in a world of once-born men. They don't understand our life. Uh, we, we, we march to a different... Well, I started to say we march to the beat of a different drummer. You know, we, Yeah, we do. And, and the drum and everything else for us is different. We're, we're like, we're like 
uh, fingernails on the world's chalkboard. And, and our lives are contrary to the lives that people live around us. And, and we become strange and misunderstood creatures. Now, it doesn't take much study or look today, nowadays, to find this out. You know, there was a day when I could have said something like that, and you could have been sitting here going, well, it's not, you know, it's not too bad. I mean, most people respect us, you know, most people. I mean, they don't do things on Wednesday night when we have prayer meeting. You know, the schools don't have programs and plays and skits and PTA meetings and ball games. Nobody plans things on Sundays. They always leave Sundays open because they respect the church and the fact that people go to church. And, and, so, and, and, and that's the world I grew up in. But nowadays, uh, we grow, we, you, you just look around. I mean, it, it, this world is totally contrary, to, especially to the things of God. I mean, Sunday's just another day. Every store around us is wide open and running. Uh, Sunday means nothing to anybody anymore. There's no respect for Christian values or for Christian customs or for anything Christ-like. Wednesday night, it doesn't matter. Boy, they'll play tournaments, you know. It, 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 there's no respect for any of that. But, but this shouldn't surprise us because Jesus told us that it was going to be this way. You remember, he looked at us and he said, I'm going to tell you something. A servant is not better than his master." And if they hated me, they're going to hate you. And he told us, in spite of the fact that they hate us, that we should be uh, happy to be persecuted for his sake. That's what the Beatitudes are all about. One of the Beatitudes, it says, blessed are you. What does our word blessed mean? <laughs> you, you guys, I know I did it several years ago, but I guarantee you still remember. Blessed comes from Markyrios, which means what? Happy. Happy are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. So what is it that causes, what is, what is it that pushes us to grow in life? Well, it's, it's a catalyst. It's, it's, it, it, here it's persecution, it's obstacles, it's, it's hardship, it's a, it's a struggle that begins to start. And we see ourselves as, as, as needy for the things of God. And walking in this faith life is not going to be easy because it, it requires faith to operate in this life. And I, I'm going to identify three types of faith that you, that, you, that you have in this life as you're persecuted, all right? And, and, and you, we, we saw them right there in the, in the Scripture, but we'll go back to it. Look at this. And Nebuchadnezzar, in his rage and fury, gave the command to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And then Nebuchadnezzar was full of fury, and the expression on his face changed toward Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And then they began to use their faith. And here's the first blank. You need a settled faith. In order to, in order to go through persecution and to grow as a child of God, you need to get some things settled in your faith. Let me just show you what I mean, what they said. Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying to them, uh, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image which I have set up? Now, if you're ready when the band plays, uh, bow down good. But if you don't worship, you're going to be cast immediately into the burning, fiery furnace. And who is that God that's going to deliver you from my hands? And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O king, we, we have no need to answer you in this matter. To set the scenario, what we've just read is Nebuchadnezzar said, I like you boys. I mean, you're some of my favorite guys. Man, I've set you over some of the provinces and some of the areas. You, you, you got it. You got it going on, man. I mean, you're smart. You're capable. Uh, you're industrious. Uh, everything about you is good, and I recognize that. And even though you're Jews and we're Babylonians still, I think that you've got some place here in my kingdom. And, and, and I just can't believe that you didn't bow down when you were supposed to. So I'm giving you another chance, boys. I mean, this is, this is grace, man. I'm giving you another chance. You got to take your chance. Now, I'm going to give you boys a few minutes to think about it. And they looked at him and they said, we don't need a few minutes. Because we've already thought about it. 
We're not going to do it. Now, what this demonstrates, it demonstrates the kind of faith that we need to develop in our life if we're going to grow in this crazy world we live in. Because remember, we grow with a currency of faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. And this little settling of our faith just has to do with, look, you need to make some decisions in your life, some big decisions. And if you'll make some big decisions, you won't have to keep making a bunch of little decisions. If you say, I am not going to steal, it's wrong, I'm not going to do it. Then when you're standing at a cash register and nobody's around and the rent's due and they come in to repossess your car and there's money in there, you don't have to make a decision, am I going to steal some money out of this cash register? Why? Because you've already made a big decision that said, I'm not a thief. Or I'm going to, I'm going to be true to my uh, marriage vow. I'm not going to commit adultery. I, I, that's not part of my life. I'm not going to do it. Then when somebody flirts or somebody uh, offers or there's a situation where you might be tempted in this, it, it doesn't even come up. Why? Because it's already come up and you've already said, that's not for me. Am I going to lie? You know, I, am I going to... Uh, these are big decisions. These are faith decisions. And I'm just saying, if you'll make a big one, you'll, you, you won't have to keep making a bunch of little ones. Because it's the little ones that get you. It's the opportunities. It's the wrong place at the wrong time. It's the, it's the no one will know. I mean, it's those. I guarantee you that the enemy will talk you in to taking advantage of anything if you, if, if you give him a chance to do that. And by giving him a chance, I mean you leave it open. Well, hmm. You know, I, I've never had trouble with that. Uh, I don't need to really get all that serious about that. I'll never do that. I, yep, and the very next thing you know, we'll be reading about you in the paper. <laughs> we'll be seeing your mug shot on, on the TV, looking all surprised that they caught you, you know. <laughs> yeah, settle faith. This is what these boys said. Mm, we don't need to think about it. We've already thought about it. If that's the case, here's what they thought about. They said, okay. If you do throw us in there, we're going to tell you this. Our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. This right here is a sure faith. Uh, there's no question about what God's going to do and what we believe God's going to do. God can do anything. And I don't know what he's going to do to rescue us, but all I know is we're sure he is. And he's going to, you cannot stand against our God. They are sure of that. So our faith has to be settled and then it has to be sure. And then here's one more thing, and this is really important. It has to be a steadfast faith. I just, the word steadfast, I couldn't think of another S word that would fit in there, right? But, but steadfast just means um, even if he doesn't. It, it, it's a, it, here it is. It's an if not clause. Your faith has to have an if not clause. But if not, <laughs> let it be known to you, O king, that we're still not going to serve you, God. In, in other words, we know our God is able to do this, and there's no doubt that he's going to rescue us, and you can't stand against our God. But even if he doesn't, we're still not going to serve you. I mean, I'm just wondering, you know, do you have an if not clause? I mean, you need one. Because you, you, there are going to be times when it's going to be a question about it. And you're going to go, well, I don't know whether, oh man, I, I know God has the power. I know he has the strength. I know he can do anything. But he might not do this for us. This might not be his will. This might not be his purpose. This, I, don't know, I, I don't know his mind on this. I know he can, but I don't know his mind. So, boy, we got to have an if not clause. Because if you don't, your faith is going to stop right there. It's not going to grow past that one iota. So how do I grow as a child of God? I'm living in a different land. I've got a different currency. It's a different way of life. Well, it involves a catalyst, and we just here it was persecution. Now, the second thing that happens, and this is where the growth kind of starts, really, protection. What did God do with this situation? Well, if you've read, if you've read Daniel 3, you know what happens in this situation. 
God comes through. God does some stuff. And in God doing some stuff, there, there are a couple of assets that you gain as God protects you in the midst of the persecution of life. Then Nebuchadnezzar was full of rage and fury, and the expression on his face changed towards Shadrach, and he commanded the furnace that they heat the furnace seven times more than it was usually heated. Let me see if I can get this thing to move forward. There, whoop. I think somebody's playing with it. There it is. And he commanded certain mighty men of valor who were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they cast him in the fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their coats and their trousers. The, uh, the Scripture just wants you to know that they, when you see them in a few minutes, just to know what happened when they went in there. They were bound in their trousers, their coats, their turbans, and their garments, and they were cast in the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king's command was urgent and the furnace exceedingly hot, the flame of, of fire killed those men that took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down, bound. Everybody say bound. bound. All right, bound into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Now, here's where it gets interesting. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished. And he rose in haste and spoke, saying to his counselors, did, not, did we not cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said to the king, True, O king. Look, he answered, I, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's some, there's some protection for you. Uh, two assets in this growth, and then I'll explain. I want you to get these words down, and then I want to just take a second and play with that just a second. Companionship, what happens in your protection? You find companionship, and second, you find cleansing. Two big, tremendous assets needed to grow in the Christian life companionship, and cleansing. All right, let's just examine this just quickly and see what happened. All right, these guys are thrown. They're wrapped in turbans, wrapped in garments, wrapped all up, bound up, cast off into the fiery furnace. The furnace is so hot, the people that throw them in die. That's how hot it is. And, and, and then, after some period of time, Nebuchadnezzar uh, uh, goes over and peers in, evidently, to the furnace... And he almost has a heart attack with the thing. He, 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 he says, guys, uh, didn't we cast three people down in here? And they said, true, O king. And weren't these people bound up and, and wrapped up like mummies? Uh, right, you got that right. Well, then somebody explained to me how I'm seeing four people walking around down in there, loose walking around, and one of them looks like Jesus. You know? One of them looks like the Son of God. Well, what happened in the protection of God? Well, two very necessary things to grow as, as children of God. I need to be cleansed. Now remember, the Babylonians wrapped them up with Babylonian stuff. The stuff that they had on, their hats, their turbans, their, their clothes, their garments, all, were Babylonian goods. So they were wrapped up with Babylonian stuff to the point that they couldn't move. When they went in the furnace and God protected them in the furnace, all it did was burn off the stuff that the Babylonians had put on them. Are you hearing that? This world puts things on us. This world binds us up. This world uh, encapsulates us with its concerns and its desires and its passions and its worries and, and, and its obstacles and its plans. This world uh, wraps us and binds us and controls our life. And what I'm saying to you is that when God protects you in the midst of persecution, the only thing that happens to you is the bondage that the world has placed on you gets burned off, cleansed by the power of God and the process of persecution. And then the second thing we need in faith is we need companionship. I've said this before. You'll never know that Jesus is all you need 
until he's all you have. And sadly, we are experts at trying one more thing. One more thing. And I'm telling you what I believe. I believe as long as you have one more thing, he'll let you try it. But when you come to the end of yourself, Christ will, 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 will capture you. He will become your friend, your support, your comfort. That friend that sticks closer than a brother. That's Jesus. And what happened in the furnace? Well, they encountered someone. Somebody was there. And Nebuchadnezzar said, man, that, that, that guy that down there, I, I don't know exactly what the Son of God looks like, but he looks like the Son of God to me. And he's walking with the guys. Now, let, let, me, let me go on and see if I've got some scripture here. Then Nebuchadnezzar went near the mouth of the burning, fiery furnace and spoke, saying, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came from the midst of the fire. And the satraps and the administrators and the governors and the kings and the counselors gathered together, and they saw these men on whose bodies the fire had no power. The hair of their head was not singed, nor were their garments affected, and the smell of fire was not on them. In other words, they didn't even smell like smoke. And none of, I mean, the hair on their head was not singed. There was no evidence they had been in the furnace. And then Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him, and they have frustrated the king's word and yielded their bodies that they should not serve nor worship any god except their own. This is an amazing statement, and I'll come back to it. I just wanted to carry you that far because I wanted you to see what happened next. All right, follow me. I know we all want to have fellowship with Jesus, right? I mean, we want, we want to be close to Jesus, and there are times where we would love to, for the Lord to be with us and we seek his presence. Now, I, maybe this is just a, maybe, the, maybe I'm carrying this observation too far. But when the boys were thrown in, how many of them were thrown in? Three. All right. When Nebuchadnezzar looks into the furnace and he sees them walking around loose, how many does he see? When the boys come out of the furnace, how many of them come out? So where's the fourth? He's in the furnace. So here's what I'm saying. If you want to have fellowship with the fourth, you got to face the furnace. How's that? <laughs> huh? Yeah. Jesus protects us. Jesus walks with us. Jesus guards us when, our, when it's necessary for him to do so. And sadly, that's theory to most of us because... We live such a pitiful Christian life, he never has to come to our rescue. And we seek him all the time. I'm just saying, if you want the fellowship with Christ, you got to get somewhere where you need the fellowship of Christ. And, and walk on into the blaze, baby. Walk on into the blaze, what I'm saying. All right. The third reality is, what happens? You get promoted. So how do you grow as a Christian? It's really a very simple process. You live by faith. That faith causes you to be persecuted because this world is not going to honor you. They don't have your values. They don't, they don't think what you think is important. They, 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 don't, they don't value your belief system. They think you're foolish, really, or simplistic or childish. Who would believe that silly stuff? That's the attitude of the world we live in. They pity us, those pitiful people. Can you imagine that, believing that there's a God and he's going to help them and they pray and they think he's going to do something. That's so pitiful. I mean, that's the attitude of the world that we live in. So if you live by faith and you demonstrate any faith whatsoever, this world is not going to honor that faith and you're going to face persecution. 
It may be somebody's talk. It may be a look. It may be a, a, a lack of a promotion. It may be a demotion. You might get fired. Uh, you know, people may point at you, talk about you, your strength, some kind of persecution. And then you're going to walk with the Lord by faith, and he's going to protect you because you're his. And as he protects you and you walk through, when it's over, you get a promotion. You're more mature. You're grown. You're, you're more capable. You're more able. Your faith is stronger. What is true in life is more relevant to you than ever before because you've walked with God. And let me just show you what happens to them. Just We'll wind this up. Therefore, you know, Nebuchadnezzar said, hey, these, this, guy, this, this God uh, of, of these boys here, I mean, hey, if any, if, 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 I don't know how he did it, but he did it, and that is the greatest thing I've ever seen in my life, Nebuchadnezzar says. Therefore, I make a decree that any people, nation, or language which speaks anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces, and their house shall be made an ash heap, because there is no other God who can deliver like this. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Good night. Whew. Happy end in the end. Man, what a, what a victory. Now, just, as, just, just so you'll know this, Nebuchadnezzar was a Babylonian. Nebuchadnezzar worshipped himself. Nebuchadnezzar was the king almighty. Nebuchadnezzar certainly wouldn't recognize God whatsoever. This was a pagan king in a pagan land and no values. And for this to be true about, about him, and, and as a matter of fact, uh, I don't know if you guys know this, but Nebuchadnezzar is the only Gentile that that wrote anything in the Bible. He wrote about he wrote two chapters in the book of Daniel. If you read it, because you know what it is? It's quotes from him praising God. <laughs> like that right there. So Nebuchadnezzar is just talking about how great God is and how marvelous and majestic and powerful and, and to be worshiped and to be praised and to be exalted. And it goes on for two chapters in the book of Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar. They're just quoting Nebuchadnezzar, the pagan king who didn't know God, but got introduced by three boys that wouldn't bow, wouldn't bend, and wouldn't burn. You know, thank God. All right. Thank you.